Hello, everybody. My name is Ido Aharoni, and I'm very, very happy to host you here for our fourth annual uh, Ingeborg and Ira Reynolds Forum on International Relations at NYU. Um, th those of you who don't know me, I've been with NYU for four years now. Before that, I was uh, serving in the Israeli government, the Foreign Service. And since oh. arriving at NYU, uh, we established the an annual forum to discuss um, changes and developments in the um, field of international relations. So a couple of um, housekeeping uh, comments before we begin with the program. Uh, those of you who would like to ask questions, please uh, type them right into the, um, the Q&A section, not the chat section, the Q&A section here on the right-hand side of the screen, the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Um, we will begin with um, a few words of introduction, then I will introduce Dan Marone. Before that, I will ask um, um, our very able Noam Ear, the CEO of the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy, to say a few words about the work of the forum, which is a co-sponsor of the Renard Forum for four years. And then after uh, Dr. Marone will speak about um, the world post-COVID-19 uh, challenges and opportunities, uh, we will open the floor for your, uh, for your Q&A. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to say a big thank you to uh, Nicolette Teta of NYU International Relations Program, who really um, helped us a great deal producing this event. Our very own Sydney Denon, who will be leaving, unfortunately, in a few days, but Sydney has been a great help to everything that we do here uh, for the past seven months. And uh, next week, she will start a whole new chapter, and we wish her a lot of success. Um, I would like to thank Celi Charney, uh, who's been the driving force behind so many in initiatives, but uh, close to my heart is the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy. I was asked to serve as the chairman, and I'm gladly doing that. And um, I don't think Celi is on the line right now, but she's with us in spirit. Of course, I'd like to thank Dr. Dan Marom, who uh, took the time to be with us, although his schedule is extremely busy, and uh, you'll hear why in, in a second. And, and last but not least, obviously, to the Renard family for making this whole thing possible. Um, Noam Ear. Noam Ear joined the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy a few months before the COVID-19 uh, crisis and brought with her tremendous level of energy, professionalism, and insight. Um, I asked uh, Noah to join us today uh, to give us a little bit of background about what's the Charney Forum for New Diplomacy, what is New Diplomacy, and what's the connection between that and what we're doing here today. So Noah, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ido, and thank you for those warm words. And uh, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I promise to keep it brief. Um, so as Ido said, I joined the Charney Forum um, several months before COVID-19, which sort of served as a great jumping board for us. Um, the forum was started uh, in the head of Ms. Tilly Charney and with the vision of Ido Aroni about a couple of years ago when the, what, what stood in front of them, what they wanted to, to do is address the dramatic shift that has taken place in diplomacy from G to G, from government to government, to people to people. And as in, in one of this, these many amazing programs in NYU, you can, it's what Ido started calling citizen diplomacy. So we're talking about this shift that was created as a result of the information uh, revolution. And because there's an information overload we see that a lot more information is at people's uh, fingertips and they can affect and create change. And Ms. Tilly Charney wanted to elevate the uh, communication and collaboration. And I think she may actually be here with us because she was trying to uh, sign in. Um, but she, her aspiration as part of her many other projects was really to raise the conversation uh, that we can have between ourselves, both regionally and internationally. Um, so COVID-19 is another form of disruption on top of the disruption that we already have been experiencing ever since the uh, smartphones came out. And that's made new diplomacy even more relevant because we are all dealing with a new world and a new situation. And even though we have so much information at our fingertips, 
simple solutions are offered for very complicated situations, such as the Brexit, just to name one. And the forum offers together with the University of Haifa programming, starting from seminars and workshops, online, offline. Um, they're really tailor-made according to the target audience in order to supply, um, provide tools and skills to navigate in this new reality of information overload. Uh, we had a panel two weeks ago, it was our first digital online event um, with 60 participants where we addressed the day after COVID-19 from many different perspectives. And that's one of the main things that we would like to emphasize how, as opposed to the polarization today where there's only, it's either black or white, we're trying to address all the gray in the middle and, and stimulate conversation about the many different aspects of geopolitics and other uh, such uh, topics that are discussed in this field. And um, we offer programming that can either be something with an official certificate at the end, which is more like an ongoing um, course, I'll call it for lack of a better name, but we also do ad hoc events that can either be a panel or, or as I said, a workshop. And if anyone's interested further, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, just look us up on our website. And thanks again for the opportunity. And back to Idor, on to doc Dr. Marom. Um, I will introduce him first. Thank okay. you so much, Noah. And uh, those of you interested in visiting the website, it's www.charneynewdiplomacy.com. It's a great website. Um, and now I'd like to introduce um, our main guest tonight, Dr. Dan Marom, who's a friend and a colleague. He is a member of the faculty of the business school at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. is considered to be a leading thought leader in FinTech. He authored several pioneering books in the subject of crowdfunding. And um, he's also a leading figure in the growing field of impact investment. He holds a PhD in finance from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, an MBA, cum laude, and a degree in electrical engineering. So it's an interesting combination of management, electrical engineering. He authored three books so far, The Crowdfunding Revolution in 2010. Um, he then went on to co-author the book Crowdfunding the Corporate Era in 2015. And these days, his latest book, Crowd Assets, Crowdfunding for Policymakers, is coming out. He is known for his precise insights, which are based on rigorous analysis of data as part of his uh, research and his work. His current focus is empowering impact projects for and ventures that are targeting undeserved, underserved communities in emerging countries. Dr. Dan Marom lives in Tel Aviv and is joining us tonight from Tel Aviv. Dr. Marom, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Ido, Noah, Nicolette, and everyone else. A, a friendly regards from Tel Aviv, and thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor for me. I'll be much less official in the next 29 minutes, and hopefully much more blunt. I have a few questions which will hopefully serve as a food for thought, illustrating my journey through the COVID-19 as a scholar and mostly as a businessman, and trying to cope with some questions, uh, I'll, I'll answer my answers and then open the floor for other thoughts as I hope it will be more of a dialogue than a monologue and we're getting uh, questions uh, via the chat and uh, feel free to use your uh, rude manners uh, to, to jump and ask and object. Let's make it even more interesting and more concrete. So we definitely live in a crazy world, a crazy world where we didn't think it would be like that. Uh, I, I'm not certain that uh, many of us thought that we'd live in uh, such kind of a world. And if we zoom out, looking at ourselves, it's definitely crazy. It's crazy in so many ways in health, business, uh, social, and all other manners. And if we spoke about previously about VUCA, about the, the aspect that the world is, very, is suffering from volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, I think we reached a peak. In the next 28 minutes, I'll try to, to, to make a journey with you on trying to transform volatility into some kind of a vision. 
which at least helped me calm and make some business decisions. I'd like to turn uncertainty in your own perspective into some kind of understanding, a complexity into clarity, and I do think that if we stay agile, we can succeed. So that's my goal for, for this session. And I, I, I'm, I'm not being humble enough, but I'll try to do it not only with my questions, but also with your participation. I think that we can do this transformation if we zoom out a bit, because currently, and I know for some of you who live in, in New York City and suffer it much and other places across the globe, and, and if you have family or friends that uh, got hit from this pandemic, I know it's hard to do. But I invite you in the next few minutes to zoom out a bit, to ask yourselves questions. And mostly, I, I invite you to find the opportunities that lie in the middle of this huge difficulty. I'll tell you a bit about myself from a different perspective than Ido said, and I, I'll try to speak more about my failures, uh, as Ido was too kind uh, to tell about things that I didn't know that existed about my so-called success story or call to fame. I just stumbled upon crowdfunding while doing my PhD. I found a platform who helped musicians to fund their next venture. And I thought that crowdfunding could not only help public enemy or the likes, it could help entrepreneurs globally. So I went into finding my way and paving my own voice, creating my own voice in this field, Googling for crowdfunding, finding someone uh, 10 years ago at the Silicon Valley talking about trends. And one of the trends was crowdfunding. Uh, I, I used my Israeli chutzpah or being blunt to just email him and we became good friends. We wrote a few versions of this book uh, and we sold quite a lot of copies, not because it was good book, a, a good one, only because it was the first, and we've done it remotely. I haven't met with Kevin uh, until a few years later. Uh, so we've done it all remotely, much prior to Corona and social distancing. And, and from that, I, 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 I wrote another set of books and uh, the most interesting thing that happened when, while working with the World Bank, that I was sent to Africa and I just felt in love, fell in love with the opportunity of doing good while doing well. Uh, we failed dramatically in that project, but what happened was uh, for me an insight that changed my life, and I'm sorry to be cliche. I found the world, I just stumbled into the world of impact investments. Uh, and, and since then, I'm trying to be 100% impact and investing my time and effort into aligning capital and values and trying to break that glass ceiling of philanthropy where I think that if we can make money work for social challenges, we can make the world better. So that's what mostly I do. Uh, um, in, in this, uh, and, and last comment regarding this presentation, my biggest hope is that uh, I'll, I'll be serving very humbly um, as a bridge between intention and action. Uh, I, I hear a lot about a lot, lots of diets and all of them are good ideas. Unfortunately, to put them into action, it takes lots of motivation, at least for me. I know that for, for Ido, it's not a challenge. <laughs> so, I, I hope that in the next few minutes you'll be, be open enough and more than that, motivated. And if you'll have only one idea and put it into action from what we'll speak, not only about my thoughts, but others, uh, it would be a, a wonderful honor for me. Back to COVID-19. Uh, Noah said that it's a huge disruption and I'd like to question that, whether in, in, in a few years from now, it would be year 2000 bug, and I'm, I'm being blunt here, so apologies for that. Whether it would be bug 2000, or it would be HIV or AIDS, what would be the consequences of this pandemic? And I'm not speaking now on the issues that uh, uh, we have social distancing and we stay at home to keep safe, et cetera, et cetera. 
I'm trying to look at it from lenses of a few years' time, and I'll get back to that. The, uh, and, and a popular saying is that about uh, COVID-19, which is a black swan, it's a wonderful book by Nassim Taleb, uh, highlighting the fact that the extreme impact of rare and unpredictable outlier events. I truly love the book, and I feel that there's lots of insights there, and with a strong argument that we should build robustness uh, in order to cope with such events. But I feel, and, and that's out of uh, my own insights and my own anger about not understanding the COVID soon, uh, early enough business-wise, I feel that it's not a black swan per se. I feel that we had early signs. I feel that we had early voices that spoke about COVID-19. And some of these early voices were very loud. I think it's th this COVID-19 is much uh, the, the analog for that by Michelle Walker, the author of Gray Rhino, is, is perfect. I feel that sometimes we have highly probable, high impact, but we neglect threats. And gray rhinos are, are not random surprises. We have a dot, we have a gray dot out there, and it's running like a rhino. It's ru running at us, and sometimes we don't think it will smash us. We don't think it will smash us, but it runs so fast and it's so strong that I feel that the analog for great rhino is, is much more suitable for COVID-19. The question whether it's a black swan or gray rhino is not important enough, but the fact is that we had early signs not only a few years ago. We had early signs coming back to late December and for for most of the business leaders that I'm familiar with and with most of the politicians and the decisions maker that I'm familiar with, at least in Israel, there was a big gray rhino running at us and finally we got smashed. So my first insight out of this uh, pandemic is the fact that uh, we have a radar of gray dots. Gray dots are gray rhinos and they're running. We can't neglect them, and I'll get back to that. We can't neglect them because they will hit us one way or another. And this time, I think the two month time of preparations until most of the countries got in action, I think that we can learn some insights from that regarding the next time. And again, we'll go back to that. So uh, from a corona to a global crisis, four phases, a shock, disruption, a global one, and now we're starting to see recovery in some, in some countries. Uh, it's, it's, the Bill Gates, the one that uh, had an early evidence regarding uh, such kind of a pandemic, called it pandemic one. And he had a wonderful note about the fact that uh, our parents or our grandparents lived through World War and then they'll remember forever World War I or II and our generation will remember forever pandemic one. On one hand, he was very optimistic, saying that we'll cope with it and science will win, etc. On the other hand, he spoke dramatically about the long-term influence of COVID-19. I'll, I'll let you choose the answer yourselves. For me, I'm not certain. I'm not certain that the world will change, and I know it's much more popular to say that the uh, office spaces will die and people will work remotely and will be more kind to earth or to our colleagues and will be better parents. Unfortunately, in countries that uh, coped well with COVID-19, I see them coming back to the same place that they were before, exactly to the same place. That's Bill Gates talking about science. And later you'll get, uh, for those who are interested, they will upload the uh, the slide deck, PowerPoint, PDF uh, to the forum, and you can use it freely, of course, if, if it has some value. And after going all, all through the grief cycle, I personally started with denial and anger. I bargained with myself and with God. 
I was in, in, in depression because of business and because of life. And I gained confidence. And more than that, I started feeling hope. And I feel that hope not only personally. I feel that hope is starting to be the new normal. And remembering uh, Winston Churchill's uh, very strong sentence about never letting a good crisis to go, go to waste, early on I decided that this pandemic, and, and of course it's, it's horrible for more than um, hundreds of thousands of people that died and unfortunately will die and for their family, and it's, it's, this crisis is huge and, and my heart goes for them. But I think that there's a huge opportunity that we shouldn't waste. Unfortunately, this call for action is about the way that I feel that uh, most of us will not use this crisis in order to leverage it for good. And, and my wish in this hour is that we'll stop for a minute and think what kind of opportunities that we have, what are the kind of insights we had during this crisis, and what can we do better in the future. All of us went through survival and stabilization. In the next year or so, we'll co-live with the virus, unfortunately. Uh, scientists says, and I, I read science last month, uh, predicting that in 18 months, we'll have a vaccine. So we have a year, in, a year and a half of co-living with the virus. After that, we'll have to cope with the new normal. And I had a question mark here because it's very trendish to say that there's a new normal. It's very trendish to say that everything will change. I argue that not everything will change and I argue that most of the things won't change. I'll leave it as an open question. Uh, coping with the, the virus and, and coping with uh, social distancing and businesses that were shut down uh, and co-living with it for the next year with a recession is a huge challenge. I think that what helped me made a leap was thinking about what will happen next year. Not thinking about this year and we'll get back to that, but thinking what will happen after the vaccine. And let's imagine that we're in the third or fourth quarter and I'm trying to imagine what would be the new normal. Will indeed, as, as I've said earlier, everything will change, will consume less, will travel less, will be more kind to earth, whether such kind of a social or psychological experiment, the largest that ever conducted, will change us. Whether indeed to change a habit which says that we need between a month or two. And, and, for, and there's a shutdown for more than two months in many countries. Will indeed, we'll get new habits, a better ones, will, be, will we become better citizens? It's a big question. My answer to that, and I don't have a crystal ball, my question is that we'll cope with it very soon. It will not take us so many years like HIV. It will take, it will take us much, much faster. And when I ask these three questions, I, I wanna give my, my answers soon, but I, I wanna give you 60 seconds to, to, to ask yourselves what you think about these ones. What would happen in your industry, for your business, for your nonprofit, for your career? Whether a post-vaccine, let's say it's in 12 or 18 months, do you think that there will be a new normal or will stay the same? I'm highly invested into tourism and real estate. Maybe I'm biased and optimistic, but I think that people will get back to traveling very soon, even sooner than a vaccine. So for me, the new normal, 8020, 80, there won't be, unfortunately, a new normal. Second, what are the pandemic opportunities in your field? What are the pandemic opportunities you can leverage in the next year or afterward? And I'll, I'll illustrate a few. And last, 
what are the gray rhinos that are currently on your radar? Do you have gray dots? Personal ones, global ones, business ones? For me, there are a few. And for me, I'll try not to ignore them in the next few years. So five thoughts just before we, we take some questions because I'm looking for a dialogue more than a monologue. That's a, that's a sentence from our Bible. Uh, there's no new thing under the sun. I, be, I, I was deeply into the crisis and as, as I've illustrated the grief cycle. When I try to zoom out nowadays, I understand at least personally I wanted to write 99% because I'm used to writing bold sentences to sell books, but I hesitated and wrote 80%. I believe that in a year or so, we'll get back to the same. We'll travel, we'll, uh, be, uh, we'll have lots of pollution, we'll drive, we'll get back to conferences, we'll get back to meetings. In Israel, we'll hug when we'll meet each other. For me, it brings comfort, but more than comfort, it brings me an anchor that I can plan. I'm, I'm keen to learn what's your thought on that. Second, I think that this, uh, in, in the, at least in Israel and in many other places, at Israel, the startup nation, there's lots of innovation uh, happening here. Cyber has, be, has become a very big industry. I think that virology will be the, the new cyber. Cyber is built on fear. All the cyber industry from diagnostic of cyber through handling threats, etc., is built on fear. I think that we'll have a new industry. It will be built on fear. And there's lots of opportunities there from diagnostic to handling the threat to all sorts of other uh, tools that will help people cope with this fear. Third, is I think there's a huge opportunity in risk management. It could be for insurance, for finance, for all sorts of other industries. I believe that in the next few years, risk management will be on the rise and many corporates will invest much money into it. Fourth, I feel that stress and dep depression will, will create a huge opportunity, business-wise, health-wise, social-wise, policy-making-wise, there's lots of fear in the streets. Stress and depression won't leave us very soon, unfortunately. Lots of opportunities and lots of things to do there. And fifth, and maybe just because I'm biased, I think that something changed. I think that we're, that the man's search for meaning uh, became stronger, better, faster. And I truly hope that it will grasp the feeling that we we had and soon we'll get back to normal. It won't be the new normal. It would be the old and classic normal. That's my thought. But my hope is that we'll continue to search for meaning, meaning of finding in ourselves as parents, as friends, as citizens of this planet, etc. And I hope that it will serve the impact industry to, to flourish more and more and to help people align the values and capital. I, I, I want to end just my session and open the floor for questions, just as a wishful thinking that we'll take this crisis and take it as an opportunity. And also, don't be a stranger, shoot me an email. If there's anything I can do for you on a friendly basis, uh, it would be a huge honor for me. You know, you gave me 30 minutes. I've done it in 27. Excellent, uh, excellent. I have, I have 80 question. more slides for the next three minutes. Uh, okay, so um, let me let me um, ask you the first question, if 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 I may. Um, the um, and let me know if you still want to share the slides or you want to take them off so that we can the the participants will be able to see your beautiful face exactly. So. Here's the first question. So you're basically predicting, uh, if I understand you correctly, that things will go very quickly back to normal. Um, what do you say about the scenario of uh, recurring 
crisis, right? So for example, in Israel, to those of you who are not in Israel, you should know that in Israel, we're about 85% back to normal. And yesterday was reported that there was a spike in the number of, um, of new cases. Now, having said that, Israel is not, was not hit hard by COVID-19. So my question to you, what if this is a recurring um, event. What if we're looking here at an event that will force us to redefine the very meaning of safety, just as HIV AIDS redefined the very meaning of safety within the context of sexual relations, and just as 9-11 redefined the very meaning of safety within the context of travel, maybe COVID-19 will redefine the very meaning of, of, of safety in the context of interpersonal interaction, if it, if it is. And that's the first question. The second question I have for you is, what is your opinion as to the um, mysterious differences between places that were hit hard and places that were not hit hard? Uh, places that are extremely crowded like the Gaza Strip or Cairo or even Israel. Um, how do you explain that, that huge difference, this huge gap in the behaviors of certain, is it all about climate? Is it all about demographics? What is it to your, in your opinion? So I'll start with, thanks for these wonderful questions. I'll, 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 take the, I'll start with the first one and I'll take two perspectives on that. I first thought that you're gonna talk about COVID-19, COVID-20, COVID-21, just as an analog for, for a place where we'll have serial pandemics in the next few years. For that, I think that science will win. And I think it would be a much shorter cycle than the ones that you illustrated. I'm, I'm quite, uh, I'm, I'm positively, maybe I'm positively biased, but I see early signs that uh, for the amount of uh, resources that are invested, for the brain power that are put into it, and for the money, that are behind, that's behind this trend, I think that we will win much sooner than the time it took for HIV and other issues. So if you look at the macro scale from a year's perspective, I think that the science is on our side more than ever. Now regarding the, 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 the first question, but in, in another perspective, you're totally right that in the next, in the short term, or even mid term, we'll have some spikes. And we need to cope with them. That's called living with the virus. I surely expect that in the next year or so, we'll have various spikes due to weather, due to other, we'll, we'll open the skies again, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to cope with skies. My saying regarding that uh, nothing is new under the sun and what has been will be, is from a year's perspective. And I think it provides some calm perspective on what will happen and an anchor to plan. Because I feel that uncertainty is about the, the or, or making uncertainty certainty is the ability to make some long-term perspectives. And everyone can take their own perspective, that's only my own. Regarding the second, Although it's, it's very trendy to become an epidemiologic uh, currently, and, and I wish I had some prior knowledge regarding it, I'm not certain whether it's uh, weather, whether it's the genes, whether it's the, the fact that in, uh, I, I was very concerned regarding emerging markets. And you see that the, most of them were not hit very hard. Uh, I, I suspect that it's because of the short life expectancy and the fact that there, there are no, unfortunately, there are no chronic illness in such kind of places. You just, you just don't, don't live with them, unfortunately. And, and I'm saying with the, with the large pain, although I might not seem so, so, I'm very concerned regarding health and emerging markets. The fact is that uh, if you live under a, a average until 58 in Sub-Saharan Africa, you don't develop chronic illness. And, and, it's, uh, and if you live in circumstances like these, you get killed much prior to corona. I get it. So your, your point is that maybe, and it's, it's an interesting perspective, that maybe the reason those places were not hit hard is because P 
people don't get a chance even to develop uh, chronic diseases because the healthcare system is not good enough and they just die beforehand. I've never yeah, heard this maybe explanation. Bit, maybe a bit, a bit cynical, but just to, to make my point, I think that uh, there's no equal opportunity and is, even the, there's no equal opportunity in, in fronting corona and dying from corona. You don't have an opportunity to be uh, to live until 82 or 70 plus and die yeah. of it. And I'm very concerned regarding it. That's another chat, I guess. But I, I feel that we can't be, we, we are not doing enough for health and for prosperity in such kind of markets. Right. So we have a wonderful question here from Lauren, um, who's, who's comparing this to the Great Depression. She said the Great Depression uh, brought about the closed borders, trade barriers, unemployment in excess of 25%, and increased nationalism, and the consequences were catastrophic. So what makes you believe that this time around, the economic devastation, I'm not talking about the virus now, I'm talking about the economic devastation caused by the virus will not bring about a similar result? So th thanks for, th for this question. I think that 100 years later, policymakers uh, have taken some notes and took action much differently than uh, was in history. They decided to push the economy very quickly, operated promptly, and I, I think saved a, a huge chunk of that. Uh, I, I don't think that we'll get into such kind of a depression and the catastrophe from that due to the fact that governments in most places, not in Israel, but in, in most places, in modern ones, in developed ones, operated very soon, very quickly and very strongly. So um, now when you say operated, do you mean the pouring of financial resources exactly. into the market, into the economy? Exactly. Because the Great Depression Lauren is talking about resulted in the New Deal. Question is, and the New Deal is remembered and known for really upgrading America's infrastructure, turning America into the, the superpower that it is today. Question is, do you think it's the time for a new New Deal? So it's, it's a wonderful question. Uh, it's, and it's an interesting thought. I think that uh, it, 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 it correlates with your last question regarding the next wave of COVID-19 or COVID-20 or COVID-21. I think that uh, we'll see in the next few months whether we need to cope with a new, a new wave of pandemic or um, the science will help us win sooner. Uh, maybe it's a wishful thinking, but I truly believe that in the next few months, We'll have more and more answers and we'll be able to operate in a smarter way coping with this uh, pandemic. Wonderful. The few weeks ago, we had a speaker here in this very forum who introduced us to a new concept called informational distancing. So he said there is social distancing, but because of the information overload that Noah Meir was discussing in her opening remarks, there is a new type of threat, too much information or too much irrelevant information. Alexandra is asking, um, how do we mitigate fake and extreme news given the stress, grief, and search for meaning in addition to the actual science of what's going on, right? So there is science. Not everyone is doctor with a PhD from Hebrew U that can tell the difference and has the capability of verifying sources of news. Um, Alexandra is asking, what tools do we have to make that distinction? So uh, before, before answering to this wonderful question, I'll say that there's a negative correlation between having a PhD and making money. So I'm not <laughs> uncertain regarding uh, those who have PhD and being more smarter than, than others. Uh, and I'm not only being humble, I'm being serious. Um, so, so that's about the last part of your question. Regarding information overload, I, I definitely think it's an issue. I, I'm not certain it's an issue that uh, happened due to Corona. 
Uh, and, and by the way, when I'm saying that uh, there's nothing new under the sun, we had the uh, e-commerce before, we had the uh, telemedicine before, we had all sorts of technologies. And I, I think that the only thing that will change habits is technology. It's not about the time that we spent in shutdown and it's not about the uh, regulation. It's about if we'll have good enough technology that will be easy to use. And, and, and I didn't forget your question. I'm just uh, acting like a politician answering to a different one. Um, I think that the only way to change habits in the new modern world is about having technology that will be good enough, easy to use, that could help us change habits. It could be diet, it could be climate change, it could be whatever. That's the only way for me. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to consume, we'll continue to drive, we'll continue to pollute, we'll continue to, to travel until the point that we'll have uh, solutions that are easy enough to implement. Regarding uh, your question that uh, I was able to forget uh, while having this uh, passionate monologue, uh, <laughs> can you remind me about that? All right. So I don't remember my question myself, but okay. let me um, but let me let me guide you in, in because I've been listening to you very attentively. Um, I, I asked about informational distancing. Oh, you're right, right. And right. what what are the tools people yeah, yeah. can use? to make a distinction between what is fake and what is real, because we, yeah. we've been all bombarded with, uh, with information. And if I can add to that another layer um, to the question, you said very, very uh, aptly and profoundly that technology always responds to the fears, to the most basic fears of, of human beings. And that's why you believe that virology is the next big thing in scientific uh, exploration, and I and I tend to agree with that. Um, I, I would bundle it under something much bigger than virology, which is predictive medicine. Imagine what could have happened to economies and countries if they were able to custom-made and customize medical treatment based on your susceptibilities and vulnerabilities as a patient. Um, isn't it something that we can aspire for from a technological point of view? Definitely. Predictive, predictive medicine. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with the information overload and then I'll get back to your, uh, forget it and then get back to your question. Uh, regarding information overload, uh, now I remember the segue that I've done. I don't think it's new. I, I think that we had information overload much before and now due to fear and due to the fact we need to find some calm anchors, we try to uh, consume so much information that maybe can help us. I think that the best way to cope with it and start with the uh, uh, reading the, uh, about more, more about data than opinions so that we can shape up our opinion. I think that uh, in many places the discussion is very shallow. Talking about uh, like mine, for example, talking about uh, opinions and not uh, illustrating the data. So I think that data anchors are, are important for information overload because it's not, it's, it's mostly about various opinions and various thoughts and might be fake news as well. Regarding uh, predictive medicine, um, I, I truly agree. I think that we'll see a leapfrog in resources that are put into that, which will result in, in hopefully some wonderful solutions for our generation. All right, Bruce is, um, is asking about, um, is making a comment that history has taught us how people and businesses adapt to new requirements regarding safety measures. Uh, the uncertainty exists with what our local and national governments will do to stimulate our business. So new business models need to adapt and be prepared uh, for the unknown and supported by governments to affect impact survival of business plan. So Bruce himself, who is the founder of, of many companies, one of them is a media company called Big Block Media based in Los Angeles. He writes about what he does. Our company has gone on the offensive early on and are looking to adapt with models that, are, that we 
can impact now and continue to turn it up as corona vaccines help to stabilize the world, the world economy. I should also say that Bruce's companies um, during the, the crisis increased their, their presence in Israel, actually. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's good news. So if you, if you have a, a comment about that, um, about what really companies should be doing these days to better prepare for the, let's assume that this is a dress rehearsal, right? That COVID-19 is just a dress rehearsal for the big one, right? The big virus that truly is going to affect everybody because this virus is affecting very, very certain people, you know, very certain group of people. Um, what uh, Bruce is asking, what businesses can do in order to prepare for the big one? So I, I think that uh, there's a huge opportunity for media companies to be a catalyst for change. And I'm, I'm very glad that Bruce is doing that already. I think there's a, it's, it's a perfect time to shine uh, regarding echoing positive, um, positive messages and, and creating the change that we want to leverage out of this crisis. I, I'm, I'm personally very optimistic. I don't think that we should be in shelters waiting for the next bomb. I think that we should celebrate life and we should make risk management relevant and make the decisions but i feel that uh, the the right thing to do and that's of course my only pers my only humble perspective is about getting back to normal leveraging the beautiful things that we have enjoying what we've learned due to shout down and and taking that into action after we everything will be open regarding the next big thing uh, which might happen, COVID-20 or something, uh, that's definitely a threat. And as we've seen previously for the last 20 years or so, uh, the frequency of such things happening uh, is becoming, uh, unfortunately, a threat. Uh, definitely, we should invest in safety. Definitely, there's room for investment in virology and the likes. And, and, and I think there's lots of opportunities business-wise and health-wise in that sectors. Now, Christopher here is asking a very interesting question. It's as if I wrote it, because he's writing, he's writing about something that we noticed in the Forum for New Diplomacy a long time ago, which, which is called the non-centrality of governments. We see leaders that are less and less interested in the well-being of their publics and more and more interested in the well-being of themselves. And into that vacuum, business leaders, right? So when you're looking at who's, pre, who's preoccupied with space today, not national leaders, mostly business leaders like Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, and so on and so forth. So the question that Christopher is concerned with, um, is it, are businesses capable of entering this, this vacuum? And it, it, you should also share his sentiment that governments have abandoned the concept and roles of compassion and support to the vulnerable. That's indeed a wonderful question. I think that the blame on who's, who are the leaders are, is on us. We vote for them. We make them our kings and queens. And if you look at leaders across the globe, unfortunately, they are not the ones that I hoped they would be. Um, and I know it's recorded, so I, I need to be a, a bit more cautious about it but I feel that we, we use our votes to, to find that reality stars, unlike the heroes that I wanted to be, the, the ones that are leading with the compassion, the ones that are, have the background to lead huge organizations, the ones that are, they've done something in science, and, and we're picking others, unfortunately. So the let me is, ask you, yeah, let me ask you the next question, which is a, um, a very abstract question. You know that in social science, um, and, and, and you know that because of your, of your academic background, in social science, uh, there's a very valid argument about social structure that refers to classes, right? Class predict many things, yeah. among others, your success, your, even your health, and so on. Um, there's a strong argument uh, that is being made these days that COVID-19 and 20 and 21 and 22 and so on uh, 
are basically redividing society into roughly two classes, young versus old. And in places that are recovering quickly from COVID-19, like Israel, you see that the young have visibly a very strong disregard to the virus. In other words, they don't feel it's their disease. And the old, older people, and I include in that someone in my age group, uh, are very concerned. And so the question is, how do you think this will impact economy, society, and relations between nations? So for example, Greece already announced that it is welcoming Israelis only, only Israelis. Cyprus is launching a, a tourism campaign luring in Israelis because they say in Israel that was mildly hit by COVID-19, there is no risk for us. And what will happen to an older person that wants to go to Greece versus a young person? Yep, and a very interesting question. I'll try to, to give my perspective on that. Uh, as first as an anecdote, Cyprus has done more than that. They, they, in their campaign, in their recent campaign launch today, they said that they will pay if someone will get uh, hit by Corona while spending time in Cyprus. So they will pay for that. They have dedicated beds, ventilators, etc., for tourists, and they are, and, and they will pay for everything regarding medical aid for people yeah. that will in, in Cyprus. That's, that's and uh, they'll, they'll also cover the funeral. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I, I, I think that, uh, you know, green and, and red and countries that will be high on mortality will find it difficult, more difficult in diplomacy, etc. I, I think that it's a short-term response that's based on lack of data, fear, and the inability to decide. And I think that in the next few months, we'll see it changing very rapidly. Things will go back to normal. Regarding the, the I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of social mobility. So I, I thought you were about to, to ask something different about classes, uh, but uh, uh, dividing between the young, the, the, the ages is very disturbing. I feel that we need to find a solution together regarding that. There are some minor solutions in various countries that are trying to cope with it, but currently it's very, very minor, too little and too late in many cases. And I feel that the regulators should, and we should, we need to help them find the right solutions, not to create this uh, deviation between the age groups. Well, we're just ending this uh, right on time. I wanted to thank you, Dr. Dan Marom, for a very, very interesting session, and for your thought-provoking discussion. Uh, I think you, you at least you gave me a few uh, new angles to look at the crisis and to look at the recovery. And we can't wait to have you here again. Hopefully next time we'll do it in person in New York City, um, on campus at NYU. I'd like to thank again the staff at the International Relations Program. I know that Tina was also, Tina Lamb, Dr. Tina Lamb was on the line uh, thank you so much, and greetings from Jerusalem. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Places that are recovering quickly from COVID-19, like Israel, you see that the young have visibly a very strong disregard to the virus. In other words, they don't feel it's their disease. And the old, older people, and I include in that someone in my age group, uh, are very concerned. And so the question is, how do you think this will impact economy, society, and relations between nations? So for example, Greece already announced that it is welcoming Israelis only, only Israelis. Cyprus is launching a, a tourism campaign luring in Israelis because they say in Israel that was mildly hit by COVID-19, there is no risk for us. And what will happen to an older person that wants to go to Greece versus a young person? Yep, and a very interesting question. I'll try to, to give my perspective on that. Uh, 
as first as an anecdote, Cyprus has done more than that. They, they, in their campaign, in their recent campaign launch today, they said that they will pay if someone will get uh, hit by Corona while spending time in Cyprus. So they will pay for that. They have dedicated beds, ventilators, etc., for tourists, and they are, and, and they will pay for everything regarding medical aid for people yeah. that will in, in Cyprus. That's, that's and uh, they'll, they'll also cover the funeral. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I think that, uh, you know, green and, and red and countries that will be high on the mortality will find it difficult, more difficult in diplomacy, etc. I, I think that it's a short-term response that's based on lack of data, fear, and the inability to decide. And I think that in the next few months, we'll see it changing very rapidly. Things will go back to normal. Regarding the, the I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of social mobility, so I, I thought you were about to, to ask something different about classes, uh, but uh, uh, dividing between the young, the, the, the ages is very disturbing. I feel that we need to find a solution together regarding that. There are some minor solutions in various countries that are trying to cope with it, but currently it's very, very minor, too little and too late in many cases. And I feel that the regulators should, and we should, we need to help them find the right solutions, not to create this uh, deviation between the age groups. Well, we're just ending this uh, right on time. I wanted to thank you, Dr. Dan Marom, for a very, very interesting session, and for your thought-provoking discussion. Uh, I think you, you, at least you gave me a few uh, new angles to look at the crisis and to look at the recovery. And we can't wait to have you here again. Hopefully next time we'll do it in person in New York City, um, on campus at NYU. I'd like to thank again the staff at the International Relations Program. I know that Tina was also, Tina Lamb, Dr. Tina Lamb was on the line uh, thank you so much and greetings from Jerusalem. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.